me introduce Gavin Hood, who is the director of this. Can you come up? I and hope it's so. wonderful that he's come along. You know, he's got, he showed me his diary. He has four minute interviews, all up and down, Dale, you know, in America, over here, everywhere. And he's come and given up an evening, a valuable period of time, just to come here. And I'm thrilled because he's going to tell you things that I don't know about um, and you don't know about. So I'm delighted. And Gavin, we've got a little present for you, a little memento. In case you drink whiskey, it's a little kind of tumbler, which unfortunately has the Saving Faces logo on it. So it's not <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's amazing, as I was waiting to come here, to be introduced to one highly qualified person after another. I've seen some of the faces that, that I met. It's, 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 it's wonderful because um, I, I'm hoping you might enjoy this film. It does raise some interesting moral and ethical questions, um, and it is a film that I think Alan was and would be proud of because Alan, as many of you know, was a very intelligent man. He was also a great humanitarian, very kind warm and fun. And um, unfortunately, this is not a comedy, as you've probably gathered from the poster, but there are moments in it where, in the midst of great tension, Alan Rickman will just bend the line or twist or look and allow you, I hope, to laugh at moments that may feel inappropriate, don't feel they're inappropriate. The whole idea was to release some tension for a moment. Um, and Alan is the master of being able to stay perfectly in the, the, the moment emotionally and yet just give it a twist that allows you sometimes, within all attention, to laugh. And, and that is why I was so lucky to have him in this movie, because the role that he plays in this movie is a general who liaises between a group of politicians at a place called Cobra, which is a real place, it simply stands for Cabinet Office Briefing Room A. <laughs> Cobra, and they call it Cobra in Whitehall. And um, it is a room, much like a room you would have seen in images of uh, Barack Obama, President Obama, when the Osama bin Laden raid was on, sitting around a table with video screens at the front of the room. Um, there's one like that here in England, in the cabinet offices. Cabinet office room, eh? and, um, and Alan plays the role of the general, who liaises between a character played by Helen Mirren, who's a colonel in the military at another place, which is real here outside of London, um, called the Permanent Joint Headquarters in uh, Northwood, London, underground where operations, um, <coughs> international operations with multiple um, countries involved are run from. And so Helen Mirren, we were very fortunate to have played this military colonel. Some of you may have heard that the role, of Helen, the role that Helen Mirren plays was originally written for a man. It was. Um, so I'm just giving you tidbits of information because I know you want to watch the film and I should get it. No! <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, um, so, so the role that Helen plays was originally written for a man, and when I read Guy Hibbert's fantastic script, I, I kept thinking, I don't want this to be a guy's only war movie. And that doesn't mean the guys won't enjoy the war movie. It, it is a war movie. It's a movie set in where we are technologically with drone warfare now, which is in many ways very unsettling. Um, and an area of where legally it's very questionable what laws, international laws, laws of war, govern this new, the use of this new technology. Um, so Helen, Helen's, there are women who do this military intelligence officer work. In fact, we had a number of women who came to the screening of the premiere last night from the military, and we had military advisors on the set with Helen and with the drone pilots. So I think what I'm trying to tell you is what you see in this film tonight, some of it will seem potentially science fiction. You'll see teeny tiny drones, bird-sized drones, and you might think, well, what is that? It's true. Not only is it true, the drone technology is advancing so rapidly that even Professor Stephen Hawking is signing, and some people know this, has signed a document along with about 20,000 other highly educated people calling for a ban on what will ultimately be killer robots, artificial intelligence, automated warfare in the same way that chemical weapons are bad. So I'm afraid you're not in for a comedy, but you should not think of this as just a movie that we kind of made up. The, the movie you see tonight was deeply well, very well researched by Guy Hibbert, and then when I came on board three years ago, by myself too. So um, the role that Helen plays is a real 
I put all people actually do this job. I remember one day on set, we're in this bunker that we've created that simulates the permanent joint headquarters bunker. And I think it was about day three, Helen came out and we'd had a whole 12 hours of shooting and she said to me, wow, Gavin, there are people who do this job every day. How do they come down and do this kind of work every day? Um, uh, what else can I tell you that's interesting? Alan, wonderful. I wish he was here to talk about it because he was so articulate, as you know, and, and such a great conversationist. Um, Helen, uh, Barkhad Abdi is in the film. Barkhad Abdi, some of you may remember from Captain Phillips, the Somali actor who got nominated for an Academy Award on his first film. I'm very proud that this is his second film, and, and he's now done two others, because I think a lot of people saw Barkhad as, oh wow, he's so good in Captain Phillips, he's just the Somali guy, he's not really an actor. He's actually a fantastic actor and a wonderful human being, and in this film he gets to show a warmer side and a, and a, and a vulnerability that, that perhaps would, well, he was very vulnerable in Captain Fitz, but there was more aggression in the sense from him there, and here he gets to play a slightly different role. Ian Glenn is in the film, plays the Foreign Secretary. Um, that might be a moment where you might think we went a little far with the humor. It just happened to be based on a story you really heard, where a man was asked to make a little decision while sitting on a toilet. Um, um, drone pilots, I want to say a little bit about that, and then I should let you watch the film. Aaron Paul from Breaking Bad, those of you who may be Breaking Bad fans, I think you won't be, I'm sure, but for those of you who watch Breaking Bad, the young actor called Aaron Paul plays a drone pilot. So in our story, without giving too much away, Helen Mirren is the Colonel Military Intelligence Officer commanding an operation over Nairobi, Kenya. But she's not in Kenya. This is how warfare is fought now, from video screens. And the drone, the Reaper drone, carrying a Hellfire missile and cameras, all real, is watching the gr what's happening on the ground in Nairobi, Kenya, only there's no one in this drone because they're flown remotely, and the pilot, played by Aaron Paul, is thousands of miles away at Creech Air Force Base outside of Las Vegas, Nevada, again, a real place, um, and he flies that drone with what's called, a, as a pilot, with a sensor operator. The sensor operator, played by a wonderful English actress called Phoebe Fox, is the person who controls the cameras, and when they target, the camera will lock onto the target, Camera, once it's locked on target, the pilot can put the drone onto autopilot and the, and the plane will fly in tiny figure of eights, which means given the distance of 20,000 20, um, feet up in the air, the perspective on the, on the ground changes very little because it's basically in a tight orbit and the camera just stays on the target. And they stay like that sometimes for weeks. Drones, because they're pilotless, can be up in the air for many for, for 12, 18, even 24 hours if you take some of the weapons off and lighten the load. But they have um, orbits where the drone will be looking down at the target, and you're not allowed to blink. If you're doing what they call pattern of life analysis, you watch and watch and watch. Who comes in, who's on a Tuesday, who's on a Wednesday, when is that target, targeting an individual? I don't say any of this to be nice, it's creepy. And then if you're running out of fuel, the next drone is flying in, locks on the target with the cameras, you leave. The drones that you see in this movie, if they were flying over Somalia, are launched from a base in Djibouti on the tip of the Horn of Africa, where private contractors recover the drones, refuel them, re-weaponize them, and launch them. The minute they are a certain distance up in the sky, American Air Force pilots and Creech Air Force Base in Nevada take over the flight, and they fly the drones. Is this all too much information? No, it's fantastic. I, I wish I were going to be here after the film to answer the question. Unfortunately, they're dragging away to answer questions at, a, at, a, at a, a, a journalist gathering where I'm going to be grilled for an hour or two afterwards. So, um, you see, here I get to speak and you don't get to shoot me down. <laughs> um, what else can I tell you that might be of interest? The little teeny tiny drones, you're going to see them. Let's get back to those. There's a little bird. If you go on YouTube, a company in California that I spoke to, Aaron, environment makes this little hummingbird. It basically looks like a bird with a camera in it. You might laugh except it's true. You'll see it in the film. Um, then there's an even creepier one, the little beetle. It is our design, the beetle, because when we made the film, beetles, tiny drones, were being developed and still are being developed, but we were worried because we started, I started on this film three years ago. Where will the technology be when our movie comes out? Because you don't make a movie in a weekend. So we spoke to people developing these drones under strange DARPA contracts with the government. Um, at the moment, you'll see in the film that the beetle is only used as a piece of visual surveillance. It looks like a beetle. It has wings. It's like a camera in space. It flies inside and looks around. While you're watching, you think that's creepy. It's getting creepier. 
because where we might very soon be behind is that not only are these tiny drones being developed, but they will soon be weaponized. Ours just has a camera. If you look at the beetle very closely, there's a close-up on the beetle where you will see not only the little camera in the nose, but you'll see two eyes on either side. That's stereoscopic cameras, so um, you know how the human eye works, lots of brilliant surgeons here. We see in three dimensions because we have two eyes delivering two slightly different images to the brain. Well, that's the same way you can make a 3D movie. You use two cameras separated by a certain distance. You generate two images that's slightly different. You put on fancy glasses, you join the images together, and you see in 3D. Well, the beetle flies into a room, would be this room, and it flies in and immediately with its stereoscopic cameras maps the geography of the room. And now, very quickly, it has a sense of where things are. It's not looking through one eye, it's got a map. And so when you see in the film, Barkhadabi, who's flying this tiny drone, land it on a beam. It looks like he's landing it himself. What would really happen, but got too hard to explain in a movie where I needed a certain pace, is he would point at the beam that has been mapped in three dimensions, and the beetle would land itself on the beam. Um, now it gets worse. If you go on a TED talk, and this is the last thing we'll say, I'm going to let you watch the movie. If, if you're wondering about these little tiny drones, you can go on to TED talks. Many of you know the TED talks. If you don't, TED talks have wonderful speakers. There is one where you could probably type TED drones, where the speaker throws up a whole lot of teeny tiny drones above the audience, and they all know where each other are in relation to one another. So they have awareness of their distances. So they can fly in swarms. The next step, that stereoscopic vision, or the little camera, is equipped with face recognition software. You will see some use of face recognition software at a base in Hawaii. You go, oh, wow, we're in Hawaii now. There's a base, a, 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 a unit called the Geospatial Analysis Unit. We just called it the Image Analysis Unit in the movie. It took a little license because it was too much. Geospatial Analysis Unit. It's a unit that analyzes imagery from whatever source. Satellite imagery, drone imagery, photography, YouTube videos of someone. Where are these people? What I, how can I connect? And they also do face recognition and so on. So you put the face recognition software into the tiny drone. You send them out into a large area looking for perhaps you, sir. It has a visual reference map of your face. And it flies and says, finds your face, and then it boom, boom. Or it spurts a little anthrax in your nose. It's very creepy where this kind of technology is going. I don't mean to frighten you. <laughs> um, well, maybe I do. I've spent three years in, in, this, in this world, and um, I'm very conflicted about it. So the movie does not profess to tell you what to think. The film, I hope, having said all this heavy stuff, is a good thriller. It's a thriller starring Ellen Mirren and Alan Rickman and all these wonderful folks. It should be a good story. Hopefully on the edge of your seats. Um, but I hope that when it's over, you will have lots to think about and talk about. And I've tried preemptively to answer some of those questions that come up. Drone pilots, I'll say the last thing about the Aaron Paul's character. As in life, there are all full range of personalities to sign up to fly drones. They're an interesting group. The pilot that helped us on the set used to fly fighter jets, F-16s over Iraq, for 10 years. And then he was seconded to the drone unit because they now have more drone drones than fighter jets. And it's where it's going. Why put a pilot in a plane? If you can just have a plane and fly it from the ground. So now he's flying drones. It's not quite top gun, you know. You're a video jockey now, sitting in a dark room. Your life is not at risk. So for those medical folks here who are interested in the psychology of the effect on drone pilots, a whole field, post-traumatic stress disorder typically associated with your life being threatened, whether it be by a car accident or a military problem. Does post-traumatic stress disorder apply to these pilots who are dropping out of the drone program at the rate of 25 to 30%, which is double the amount of people who suffer PTSD as fighter pilots? How can this be? Their lives are not under threat. They're sitting safely in Creech Air Force Base. Well, they wake up in the morning or at night, because it's a 24-hour cycle. He wakes up at night. He drives 20 minutes down the road, and he's in a war zone. Steps into an air-conditioned cubicle with screens and flies a weapon of war that is thousands of miles away. Might be over Afghanistan, might be over Iraq. In our case, this is important, 
It's over a country with whom we are not at war. So that would be Yemen. We happen to choose Kenya. We projected a little bit perhaps too far where Al-Shabaab would be in that process. But there is more and more conflict with Al-Shabaab in that region. And now he's got a dilemma. If he's flying an operation over Afghanistan or Iraq, these are areas with clear rules of engagement for engaging the so-called enemy. You don't necessarily refer up what's called the kill chain, which is the chain of authority. It's called the kill chain, charming term, um, for authority to release a missile. So I want to say that when you see in this film a situation evolve, unfolding, which rapidly is becoming worse, the referring up from Colonel Powell to General Benson, played by Alan Rickman, to a minister, a politician who's responsible for Africa, played by Jeremy Northam, to the Under Secretary of State for Africa, played by Monica Dolan, up again to the Foreign Secretary eventually. Wouldn't, shouldn't we get the PM involved? Understand that in the particular scenario that we have created in this friendly country, that would be the kill chain. I don't want anyone to leave thinking every single drone strike goes all the way up this chain. If you're flying over Afghanistan and a group of Taliban are threatening your forces and somebody wants to pull the trigger on a Hellfire missile, the chain's much shorter. It's a defined, geographically defined conflict zone. The difficulty we have now in terms of modern warfare is that the battlefield, which used to be defined geographically, used to be us versus Germany, right? What is the battlefield now? The battlefield turns out, and there's a whole lot of legal philosophical discussion about this, does it attach to the individual who threatens us? If that individual moves into a friendly country, does what's called a kill box, by the charming term, exist around this individual, and if so, to what radius? That would allow us to use weapons of war as opposed to policing methods. There is no clear law on this yet, which is why it's so controversial. So if the film, oh my lord, I've overdone it. I hope it entertains you. I hope you experience a good thriller. I hope you're left with a lot to talk about. Multiple points of view are presented in the film through the, through the voices of different characters, and you are the jury. And I probably should take my whiskey and leave. No, no, <laughs> there's no whiskey in there. Oh, okay, we'll no, no, see. No, 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 no. <laughs> yes. I, I just thought Thank that you was so fantastic. Much. Thank you so much. Absolutely brilliant. An exposition of the film, an exposition. Oh, we should thank, thank you one, entertainment one. Ent entertainment one, yes. I'm, I'm thanking entertainment one. Okay. I'll, anyway. I'll mention it to them. I still <laughs> yes, 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 yes. That's anyway. the distributor who financed the movie. We should yeah. always thank our, yeah. our sponsors. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> Gavin, that was brilliant. Thank I you, loved folks. it. I love it. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> All right,